Good. Um, yeah, so it's going to be an active theme of uh, IGC work. But also there's a big, um, big, big project that we've got going between uh, Oxford, LSE and the World Bank uh, on, on urbanization uh, in developing countries. It's a project that started uh, some months ago and has uh, several years to run. So uh, a lot of what uh, I'm going to be thinking and doing uh, over the next couple of years uh, is, is, is going to be on that project. Uh, the project is very uh, data intensive. We're going to be looking uh, across, across cities, uh, across countries, seeing how city systems have evolved, the factors driving growth of cities, migration into cities, and so on. Uh, but also really looking into cities, uh, taking, in the first instance, half a dozen cities, and really looking in considerable detail at land use in those cities, how slums have emerged, changed, moved, uh, getting a huge amount of data, some of it satellite imagery, so we can map land use through time, and then obviously census firms, and yeah, no, no, all, all the data we can manage. So re really exciting um, data intensive project uh, that we're gonna get going on this. Um, okay, so that's the big projects that are gonna be uh, underway. Now, that project is very data intensive and very empirical but I'm not going to be doing that. <laughs> I'm not going to be talking about that today, partly because it's early, early days uh, in the project and we're uh, you know, at the data collection stage, and partly because it's not my comparative advantage. I mean, Simon and Ijaz will be talking about actual research findings and empirical stuff uh, more than me. So what I want to do instead is sort of set the issues uh, as I see them. Uh, the issues that, sh the forces that shape successful cities so I'm actually going to be spending a large part of the talk uh, talking, well, it's going to be a little bit sort of economics 101 on cities, you know, what makes successful cities. But then looking at Africa and how Africa you know, is not doing too well uh, against that model, and then a little bit on policy implications that come from that. So it's going to be a rather sort of conceptual uh, issues-driven uh, uh, talk. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, let me start by um, the scale of the challenge, just that sort of quantitative uh, motivation for thinking about this. You see the numbers uh, that I've put on the bottom of that slide. So this is just focusing on Africa. Um, Africa is probably about a third of a way through its urbanization process uh, in proportionate terms, not in absolute terms. So just doing the arithmetic on that, I mean, it's sub-Saharan Africa, we're talking about another half a billion people or so entering African cities uh, over the next 25, 30 years. Uh, and obviously population growth uh, and the, the, the urbanization process going on. And yeah, just to drive that number home to you, that's, that's over, you know, it's a third of a million a week uh, entering cities, or it's saying that Africa will have to build, uh, what are the numbers? Twice as much urban capacity over the next 25 or 30 years as it's built previously over the last 100 years. So ima imagine your African cities now, and over the next 25, 30 years, it's got to build twice that over again. And obviously, you know, city structures last. Um, you know, buildings last a long time. So it's really rather important you know, to, get, to get this right. So a huge challenge, um, I and mean, I find it hard to think of you know, more, more sort of pressing, urgent problems uh, in development economics than uh, sort of housing, uh, doing things to house that extra half a billion people and uh, get, get them jobs functioning uh, in cities over these coming decades, okay? So that's the scale of the challenge. Now, I've said I'm going to talk about issues. So I really want to start talking about urban potential. You know, how we think cities, you know, what, what cities can deliver, how they should work, Right, so I'm going to start not talking about development in particular, but talking about urban potential, uh, and then line Africa up against it uh, a little bit. Okay, so what do we know about cities? I've put successful cities there. I think I probably mean, you know, I mean most cities in the developed world, uh, yeah, more, but more or less successful. First thing we know about them is that they have high productivity. Okay, I've put that 5% number there. So in the cross-section, as you double size, productivity goes up by about 5%, which doesn't sound like a big number until you think of a city of you know, 100,000 
in a city of 8 million or something, and that's an awful lot of doublings, right? So, you know, 40, 50% productivity advantages to being in cities. So that's come out of the econometrics. It's fairly robust facts that come out of, you know, looking across cities, come out of looking at firm data, come out of looking at individual data, come out of econometrics where you've actually tracked, where you have individual fixed effects. They've actually tracked people through their lives as they move to cities and then move out again, right? Um, so that sort of ballpark number is pretty robust for developed countries. For developing countries, much less work has been done, um, you know, data issues. And insofar as work has been done, it's probably a weaker relationship for reasons that I will uh, come on to uh, later on. It should be the same relationship. It should be, uh, yeah, that productivity message, I think, should apply. So cities are productive places. Um, cities are places where new things happen. So again, you know, developed countries, we know cities are where R&D takes place, innovation, patents, you know, they, big, big cities uh, are active in that. For developing countries, possibly more important, cities are where new things start up. They're incubators. If you're going to set up a firm doing something new, do you do it in a small village or do you do it in a city? Well, you probably do it in the city. Okay? So cities have those fundamentally important uh, attributes of high productivity and where new things happen. Why? What's special about cities? Well, Jonathan's already said, yeah, ultimately, it's Adam Smith. It's uh, scale and specialization that drives it. Let me unpick that a little bit, uh, very, very, very briefly. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of big markets. It's the intensity of economic interaction. So if you think about you know, labor markets, obviously a city has a big, thick labor market. So firms looking for particular types of workers, you know, you can match skills better. Probably most importantly, the incentives to, inquire, to acquire very specialist skills are much greater in big cities than elsewhere. You know, if you're going to specialize in you know, something or other, you're only going to do it in a place where you know there are lots of potential people who will want to buy that skill, right? So that's got to be a city. Right? Um, so labor markets, product markets, you get scale and competition, right? Now that trade-off between firm size and intensity of competition is relaxed uh, the bigger the market. Uh, you get forwards and backwards linkages, you know, good old um, old-fashioned arguments from development economics. If you've got all the intermediate suppliers nearby, that sort of intensity, uh, those linkages are strong. Uh, you get knowledge spillovers. And also, perhaps, you get economies of scale just in, you know, electricity, utilities, public service provision, all that stuff. So fundamental mechanisms supporting those productivity um, numbers I gave you. The mechanisms really work through connectivity, right? This sort of density of intensity of action. So workers are close, lots of workers are close to lots of firms. Um, I had a number somewhere, I think in, in London, uh, I forget the exact number, something, something like two and a half million workers within 40 minutes by public transport of two and a half million jobs or something. So that, that, that worker firm, in interaction is it's really intense. Then consumers to firms, and perhaps most importantly, firms, firms, right? So you've got your intermediates, all that. But of course, let's think, okay, if, 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 it's, if it's connectivity driving it, then what, determine, what, what do you need for connectivity? Well, uh, it's yeah, either one or both of transport and density. So you, know, you need transport infrastructure evidently in a city. Yeah, cities are transport infrastructure uh, intensive. And that requires public investment, okay? Evidently, be it public transport or road transport. Fairly massive public investment is, is, is a key ingredient. And the other ingredient is density in the sense of you know, residential accommodation, business accommodation uh, being close together, not just sprawling out flat, but uh, being close together. I'll say more about that because I think it's an absolutely crucial point on where Africa's you know, not doing terribly well in constructing urban fabrics that support this density. 
So you can see you know, the line of argument I'm getting here. You need transport infrastructure density to generate the interaction, the connectivity that supports the productivity and so on and so on. A little bit more on density. Density is one aspect of you know, just efficient land use in a city. Right? If people are trying to get to the center to work, then land values will be high and uh, an efficient allocation will mean there's an incentive to build tall uh, and that supports density. The textbook monocentric city um, is a city where there are these rent gradients. So land prices, rent is uh, a high in the center. That's the incentive to build tall, to be dense, and then it tails off. Now, when I say sort of textbook monocentric density, people think, tend to think, oh, that's, that's just the textbook. But at this point, I always like to actually show you know, a, a, a couple of pictures for rather successful cities. Right? They are monocentric, right? These, that's employment density in uh, London, New York, and Hong Kong, right? So, you know, London, you get about 150,000 workers per square kilometer. Fantastic density uh, in the center, okay? Um, so each of those cities, um, I mean, you can spend hours looking at these maps. There's sort of Canary Wharf and Croydon and places, anyway, whatever. Um, residential density, less, less spiked, but again, yeah, that density, okay? London, much less dense than New York, and obviously Hong Kong, as you all know, and enormously uh, high residential densities. But that, uh, this message of density, efficient land use is really important. One, one other set of pictures on that. These are different cities. On the horizontal axis, different distance from the center on the vertical density. Okay, the top row are Asian cities, and they're all to the same scale, right? So Shanghai in the center there, fantastically high uh, central density. Uh, the middle row are European cities. Okay, so they've all got the gradient. A um, little bit hollowed out in the very center because that's where offices are, and this is residential. Okay, they've all, they've all got the gradient. Uh, the bottom is uh, American cities, right? So clearly levels of density depend on the transport technology uh, when the city was built, but, but they've all got that sort of shape. So the density message, I'm trying to hammer, hammer over to you a bit. Uh, these are the same figures for some non-market, shall I say, cities, right? Johannesburg obviously had a particular history that meant uh, density uh, occurred, residential density, you know, way out of the center. Uh, Moscow uh, and Brasilia, right? So density matters for connectivity, for productivity. Density can be achieved by a well-functioning market or you know, in, in, in the absence of that, uh, other controls cutting in, um, it, it's not achieved. And I would argue with, with considerable costs. Right. That was a run through, um, I think, that I wanted to say. No, one, 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 one other thing on urban potential before we actually start talking about sort of Africa uh, and development and things. So cities, <coughs> yeah, density, delivering product connectivity, delivering productivity, great. But cities are a balance between that on the one hand and they are high cost places on the other hand, okay? Um, commuting costs, land values, uh, capital costs of building, you know, the dense buildings, the transport infrastructure or whatever. So I see cities as this balance between, you know, potentially delivering productivity, but also being, being high cost, right? So there, there, there's a balance there. Now, of course, in the successful city, you know, that balance works out uh, such that the productivity offsets the cost. And indeed, there's some surplus in between, and that surplus is typically, or much of it, are typically capitalized up into land values in the city, okay? So I want you to have this sort of model of the successful city uh, in your head. One, one other thing before beginning to talk about Africa, a corollary of what I just said is that cities, yeah, they may be expensive, but they can be completely self-financing, okay? That surplus between the productivity benefit and the high cost is capitalized in land values. And land values are a very good thing to tax, okay? Land values are a great thing to tax ethically. Um, 
Because if I own a bit of land and its value goes up, it's, you know, it's, I haven't done anything to generate that. It's the, the city effect that's generated this. So in terms of fairness, it's great. It's non-distortionary if you can tax the land value, not the structure on it. Uh, it's relatively easy to, to co collect. And there are these Henry George theorems saying that the tax is sufficient to finance all the infrastructure, right? So that's the model I really have in your mind. Uh, how am I doing? Another, where's Jonathan gone? Five, six. Um, okay, let's um, talk about Africa. So it's not gonna be a great empirical uh, set of stuff, uh, but some remarks. What do we know? Um, about urbanization in Africa so far. First, it is occurring early in the sense of urbanization levels relative to per capita income. And that is sort of inherently problematic, right? If you want to build decent housing, uh, it's quite expensive. Uh, we can talk later about the actual numbers on that. Uh, and maybe, you know, there are some people who would argue Africa simply can't afford it. I disagree with that. Um, Africa is urbanizing, uh, uh, starting to urbanize at unu historically unusually low income levels. Second fact, Africa has got massive excess primacy. That is to say, the largest city uh, in each country is way larger relative to the second and third than, than, than is typical. Okay, I think lots of historical reasons for that on the role of governments in, in attracting, anyway. Um, but, but, but there is that, that, that primacy issue. So that the, the usual urban hierarchy uh, hasn't, hasn't evolved uh, in most African countries, and I think, I think we'll have to. Ab above all, um, investment levels have been too low to support the transport infrastructure required and the more general utilities, public services, that whole, you know, the whole, whole city infrastructure. Um, investment levels have been too low to support that on the public uh, investment side, and also on the private investment side, uh, private residential uh, investment levels uh, have been too low. So yeah, obviously when you look at the housing stock uh, in many African cities, it's just horribly bifurcated. There's you know, high income, decent housing, and low income shacks of, of one form or another. So well, yeah, ter terrible underinvestment and that sort of bifurcation uh, and informality. But of course, a corollary of those two uh, lacks of investment, uh, lack of investment in both those, those areas, is, is a failure to deliver the connectivity, right? If you've got, if you're not actually investing in you know, moderately high-rise buildings, by which I mean five-story, not 50-story, right? If, if, if housing is just sprawling out, then you're not delivering density. Um, if transport systems haven't been invested in, you're not, you know, that's the substitute, you're not delivering that either. So the driver of the sources of uh, growth uh, and productivity in a city are absent, right? So this failure to invest uh, is, is important. Other stylized fact, obviously, in the informality in the housing sector, also informality um, in employment. So failure to attract firms. Okay, so a very few stylized facts there. But let me try and put those together with, with that theory, um, with, with, with the model of the successful city uh, that I just outlined. I really think there's a danger that we're in a world of you know, multiple equilibria, um, poverty traps, uh, cumulative causation, the sort of world um, Stiglitz was talking a little bit about a little bit yesterday, uh, but at the urban level. So let me give you three sort of mechanisms that I think each of them have a cumulative causation uh, element uh, in them and collectively are really, really dangerous. If you think about yeah, attracting firms and jobs to cities. Well, okay, African cities are in a situation where you know, land use is inefficient. You, know, you haven't got the density, you've got sprawl instead, you haven't got the transport infrastructure. And inefficiency, by definition, means you know, relatively high cost. So these are cities that have low real incomes, but nevertheless have high nominal wages and high cost cities. So do investors come in? Does footloose manufacturing come in? Well, obviously not. 
You know, these are horribly high cost, you know, they're, they're, they're low real income, but high nominal income uh, cities uh, because land use in the city is inefficient. The cities are high cost, okay? So put that together and you're failing to attract uh, manufacturing. And there's this empirical literature on, I mean, by Doug Gollin and others on urbanization without industrialization. So you know, African cities, particularly those in resource rich countries, um, you know, urbanizing, but just you know, not organizing the city in a way, having some Dutch disease from the resources, putting that together, just not attracting um, the sort of high productivity activities you need. A second element to this, okay, structures, buildings have long lives, therefore construction decisions are forward-looking, therefore expectations matter. So it's easy to, you know, tell a story, write down a model, whatever, where there are self-fulfilling expectations. You expect your city to be uh, sort of slow-growing, not attracting manufacturing, therefore you think, you know, Rents will be pretty low in the future. If rents are pretty low in the future, you're not going to, it's not worthwhile building tall. You'll just build low. So the city will sprawl and be high cost and inefficient and won't attract the growth. And again, we're in a cumulative causation story. Another possible cumulative causation story here public finance. I've said that in principle, you know, tax the land values, it's enough to pay for everything. But there's a timing issue there, obviously. You know, the, the, the land tax comes in in the future, but you need the money up front. Well, in China, you can fix that, okay, by uh, you know, essentially expropriating the land and selling it off right, right away. But you know, th there are problems here. So weak tax systems, poor expectations, uh, inability to, to for government to capture uh, expected future appreciation means... Uh, that you're not getting the public finance to do. So putting those cumulative causation mechanisms together, I think, you know, real poverty trap, low-level equilibrium uh, stories, and real worry that existing African cities are rather, rather, rather caught uh, in, that, in that fold. Okay, final slide. Final, good. Policy. Now, I'm not going to, obviously don't have time to go through a great, uh, you know, full <laughs> policy diagnostic here. But, but a couple of points. Obviously, when you look at the residential market, uh, there are yeah, blatant, egregious yeah, market failures. Yeah, we said there was underinvestment. Well, sure, if property rights are insecure, um, if um, finance, mortgage markets are not available, if regulations are inappropriate, you know, a lot, lot, lots of African countries have got very low floor area ratios, very large plot sizes. So regulations that are simply ignored, right? So there are things that can be fixed there. Infrastructure, yeah, public policy response, obviously, uh, I won't say any more. Similarly, uh, on, the, on the commercial side. So there's a policy agenda that I set out to have sketched here very loosely, that obviously the projects will, as the empirical work goes on, get much more diagnostic, drill down, and say much more specific things other than, than just on one slide there. So just to conclude, yeah, quantitatively, an absolutely enormous challenge here, real policy challenge, and quite a difficult one, because it's across so many areas of government. You've got to get the city mayor doing it, you've got to get the finance ministry doing it, you've got legal stuff to do on property rights, uh, you've got to get industry moving in it. So it's, it's cutting right across many areas of government, so you really need kind of presidential involvement.